you refuse to Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship at Abingdon United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're here today. My name is Paul C. I am one of the pastors here, along with Glenn Patterson. It's a joy to welcome you today to share in ministry with you here at this church. Um, there's an insert in your bulletin on one side. Um, it will tell you about this series of sermons that we are beginning today called Listening Again for the First Time. Uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at familiar Bible passages in a new light. Um, and if you're new to the church or uh, new to Christian faith and these aren't familiar, that's okay as well. We're going to try to level the playing field. But uh, I look forward to getting into these passages with you in the next few weeks. 
On the other side is a flyer about the Washington County Day of Service coming up on Saturday, um, 9 to 1. There's a QR code there at the bottom and also um, a website that you can visit to sign up for one of these projects that the, that the town and the county have put together. So I uh, hope that, that lots of you will be involved in the Washington County Day of Service. And also, um, reminder uh, today, the drop-in baby shower for Moises and Carrie Martinez. Moises, who is our uh, Director of Youth Ministries, is here at the church from 2 to 4 this afternoon. And I hope that you'll be able to be here and uh, share your well wishes with Moises and Carrie. I know that um, most of you now have uh, seen the headlines and, and heard the stories about the, uh, the conflict, the attack on Israel and the, the war um, that uh, appears to be emerging in that region. Um, and I know that that's heavy on your hearts today as we gather. So during our opening time of silence, I really want to uh, encourage us to, to say a prayer for, for that conflict and for that situation. And uh, each week we do begin with a time of silence where we can take all of our thoughts and prayers to God as we enter into worship together. So now let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of Almighty God. Our opening hymn can be found on page 92 in your hymnal, For the Beauty of the Earth. I invite you to stand as we sing together.
Our prayer of confession is found in your bulletin. Together, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep us in eternal life. Dear friends, may we take a few moments and greet one another and share the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you all. be seated. And would you join me in the prayer for illumination printed in the bulletin. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. A psalter is found on page 750 in the back of the hymnal. And would you join me in this responsive song of praise? The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them God has set a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and runs its course with joy like a strong man. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, Rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them, there is great reward. Who can understand one's own errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Also keep your servant from the insolent. 
Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now I invite the children to the front for children's time with Miss Lindsay. Did you notice that when you were coming in? Yeah, was it kind of cool when you were coming in? Yeah, it felt felt not not that like icky hot feeling we've been having. Yeah, you just I was walking in this morning and I just felt good coming in. The sun was shining. Yeah, what do you notice this time of year? You can kind of notice all the all the Yeah, you notice the leaves, the colors of the leaves. The Halloween decorations, that's right. There's lots of things for you to look at. There's, there's lots of things to look at and, and be reminded, I think, of God's love. What I was saying earlier is that it's really easy for us to be reminded of God's love about great big blessings. Like a baby is born and that's wonderful, right? Or something awesome happens and, and we're, we're, we're quick to say, oh, 
thank you, God, that's awesome. And it's easy to remember God when we're going through something really hard because we're praying and we're asking for God to be with us. Sometimes we might forget about God in the little details, like in the beautiful leaves that we see this time of year or, or the cool air that we, that we feel on our skin. And I'm thinking today about new faces that we might make new friends. That's the way we see God's love is right is just all around us. So I was using these to decorate something and I thought, you know what? I just I, I can get more of these and I didn't want to bring real leaves in here because they'll just get crunchy and somebody might sneeze and then somebody will get mad at me for making a mess. But I wanted to give you guys as, a, as just a way to remember today and that, that God's love is all around and God's beauty is all around, I wanted you to take one of these little leaves with you as you leave today as sort of a reminder. And you can decorate it at your house, in your room, and you, you, you could, you could color, you could do whatever you wanted to do with it. It'll be yours, okay? As long as you just remember, God loves you. How about that? Now, after we have a quick prayer, K through 5 can go downstairs with me for Children's Church if you want to do that. And parents, they'll be right downstairs at the end of the service. Um, the ushers will help you get to the bottom of the stairs to find me, and I'll be waiting for you with your babes. And we'll have a dandy time, won't we? Yes? A dandy, that means good. <laughs> can we bow our heads and have a little prayer? Gracious God. We are thankful for all the reminders of your beauty and your love. We ask that you be with these children today and throughout their week, that they might feel your love so they might shine the light of Jesus to all they meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you want to take one of these? How about you pick one? You want an orange one? Okay. You want the red one? Okay. There's an orange one on the ground. Okay, is that it? All right. Oh. There you go. All right, Ellison, will you lead the way out for us all? We're taking our time. <laughs> all right, Nuggets, let's go. Our scripture reading comes from Exodus in the 20th chapter, beginning in the first verse, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Now listen to this reading of a portion of God's Word. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for their iniquity, for the iniquity of parents to the third or the fourth generation of those who reject me but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, you shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien residents in your town. For six days, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Then the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now again with the words of Psalm 19, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. Ten words is the literal Hebrew. Ten words. Uh, maybe you've heard it called the Decalogue. Ten words. Why ten? Well, the scholars tell us that there are ten because it's easier to remember that way than, say, twenty-five or 125, we can remember 10. Can we? Let's try. All right. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any idols. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't covet. I'll be here all week. Um, <laughs> I practiced that. To be honest, I, pract I had to practice that because I forget and you forget, I don't think it's always that easy to remember all ten. Sometimes I wish there was just one. I mean, I have trouble remembering all seven dwarfs, don't you? <laughs> don't get me started on the 12 days of Christmas. I know there's a partridge in a pear tree, but, but I, I get really, really mixed up otherwise. Sometimes I wish there was just one instead of ten. It would be easier to remember. It's good to be back with you. My family was gone last week during fall break. We spent part of our fall break um, at Walt Disney World, we, we met uh, cousins who were from Atlanta. We met them at Walt Disney World and had a lovely time. And I've told several of you, now I have to work four or five more years before I can retire to pay for that trip. But, but it still, it was a great time. But I learned that Disney, the happiest place on earth, also has a commandment. Not ten, but one. It's kind of a, a bundle. Could be three, but, but it's really just kind of one. Everybody at Disney is so nice. Oh, my goodness. They, they, they do hospitality uh, they, they take it to another level. Even the person streeping the, sweeping the street can help you find what you need. What you need. If you have a lost child, they, they can help you. We were on a ride in Epcot. And as it was about to begin, one of our cousins, who's my daughter's age, about nine years old, lost his watch. It fell right off the cart, and the cart was starting to roll. And he stood up to get it. And I reached over, too, to get it. And all of a sudden, these people who had been like, hi, welcome, hi, 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 good to see you, were like, sit down. <laughs> and I thought we were going to Disney jail. <laughs> um, we went to Mickey in the principal's office or something like that. But they, they, they eventually let the ride go, and we got to stay and spend the rest of our time. So it turns out Disney has one, it's really three, but it's all in one, you know. Stay in your seat and keep your arms and your feet inside the vehicle. That is the Disney commandment. If you do that, you can have fun. Sometimes I wish there was just one commandment instead of ten, but there are ten. But today, what I want to do is I want us to linger over one of the commandments, just one. And I believe if we spend some time with this one commandment, that it will, it will illumine all the others. It will give us insight into how to keep all of the others. And that is the commandment, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shall you labor, but the seventh day is a Sabbath unto the Lord. We studied this on Wednesday night. Here, here's an invitation for you. On Wednesday nights, we're looking at these passages ahead of time to, to get you ready to listen to the message on Sunday. And we, we dig in in different ways to the text. And i got to tell you, of all ten of the, of the commandments, 
uh, adultery, killing, coveting, none of that was controversial, but, but, but people, people raised a hand or two and asked some questions about this one. Sabbath? Is that realistic? Is that moral? Do we have to? Can we delete that? I mean, they didn't say that, but that, you know, um, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. The Ten Commandments appear in two places in the Old Testament, Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 5, both um, right there at the beginning of the Bible in the Pentateuch. In Exodus, you just heard it read, that the rationale, the reason for the Sabbath is rooted in creation. How long did it take God, according to Genesis 1, to create the world? Six days. And on the seventh day, God rested. So the Ten Commandments say, be like God. Work six days, rest on the seventh. Go to Deuteronomy, though, it gives you a different rationale. It's really interesting. You can look it up later, you can look it up now. But in Deuteronomy, the rationale is keep the Sabbath, don't work on the seventh day, because you were once slaves in Egypt, and when you were slaves, Pharaoh worked you into the ground. Pharaoh never gave you a day off. You were Pharaoh's property. Don't treat yourself the way Pharaoh did, and don't treat anybody that works for you the way that Pharaoh did. The seventh day is a Sabbath. You shall not work. But if you look closely, it doesn't just say you don't work. It says you don't work and the people who work for you don't work either. You don't make unnecessary obligations. on. It's not just, it's not just you, it's your servants, it's your children, it's your family. The Bible even says your livestock doesn't work on the Sabbath. Somebody asked a question about this. They said, now, now you can't just milk cows six days a week. Okay, fair enough. You can milk cows on the seventh, but you don't plow on the seventh day. So the question becomes, what counts as work? That's been debated for thousands of years. Jews and Christians have debated what counts as work. What does it mean not to work? What, what rises to the level? What breaks the threshold of work? Our Jewish siblings observe the Sabbath on Saturday. It actually starts on Friday night when the sun goes down. When the sun goes down on Friday, the Sabbath begins. Jim Wallace had a, a Jewish friend who he said was a workaholic six days a week. He said six days a week, that man worked 12 hours a day or more, worked his fingers to the bone. But when the sun went down on Friday, when the Sabbath began, the work stopped, the candles were lit, the family gathered, the prayers were said, and the meal was shared. It was the Sabbath. I've told some of you before that I went to high school with a girl who was Jewish. She was in the choir with us. She was a soprano. She was an all-state soprano. She was one of, one of the best singers in the state. And she would always audition for the, one of the solos in our big fall show. Our big fall show um, was always on Friday and a Saturday night in September. She auditioned, and of course she got the solo. But then it came Friday night, opening night of the big show, and where was she? Not there. She was with her family, observing the Sabbath. Came back on Saturday, but not there on Friday night. Six days you will work, but the seventh is a Sabbath. So what does this mean for Christians? Well, one thing, most Christians, most Christians have moved the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Why? Because Jesus was raised from the dead on Sunday, on the first day of the week. The early church said something that I really like. They said that God created the world in six days and completed creation on the seventh day. But on the first day of the week, on Easter Sunday, when God raised Jesus from the dead, it's the eighth day of creation because God begins new creation in Jesus. I like that. So the, the Christian church has sort of seen Sunday as its Sabbath. But we observe it differently than our, our, our Jewish friends. What does this mean for us? Some of you might have been like me and were raised with a pretty strict observance of what it meant to observe Sabbath on Sunday. Anybody here have your activities curtailed on Sunday growing up? Anybody here uh, not allowed to, to do things that you might have been able to do the rest of the week? Well, if you're like me, a lot of things weren't open. You couldn't go do them because things weren't open. That's not the case anymore, but it was then. 
when I was a kid, I read the, uh, the Little House books by Laura Ingalls Wilder, became a series, Little House on the Prairie. Anybody dating myself here? Okay. Uh, but, but Laura Ingalls Wilder said, I think it was in Little House in the Big Woods, she talked about what Sunday was like in her house growing up, and it was no fun. They went to church, and then they came home, and they sat. You weren't allowed to knit. You weren't allowed to read. You weren't allowed to play. You had to sit there and think about the Lord. And she didn't like Sundays at all. I remember, I remember, I played baseball all throughout my, my years growing up, and there were no games on Sundays. They barely even practiced on Wednesdays, because in those days, Wednesday was sort of uh, set aside for church activities. Not the case anymore, but that's what it was then. And I remember one of our practices got rained out. Not a game, but a practice. And the coach said, well, we better practice on Sunday. And I wasn't allowed to go. Now, later on, they made exceptions for that, but that's how it was. The best I can tell, there, there are two extremes. And, and, and I've learned that when you have two extremes, you can usually tell that they're too extreme. But two extremes, on the one hand, you have a very, very strict, there will be nothing, there will be no fun, no movement, no nothing on Sunday on the Sabbath. And then on the other extreme, and we see this a lot more, don't we, is this idea that Sunday is just another day. It's just a day like any other. You can go do anything you could do the rest of the week. You want to shop, shop. You want to work, work. You want to play, play. Just, it's, it's all, you know, it's, it's just another day. I'd wager to say that most people in this room don't want to be in either of those extremes, do you? But maybe somewhere in the middle, if, if we just spend a moment thinking about it, we can figure out what it might mean to be Christians who keep the Sabbath holy. Now, I'm going to say I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty because they ever have to work on Sunday. I know that there are people who aren't here who are part of our church who are working today. This is not a dig at them. I really don't want to make anybody feel guilty for working on Sunday, especially because I know somebody very well who works on Sunday. <laughs> I'll speak for myself, but I think I'm speaking for the church staff as well. And then when, when you work on Sunday, when your Sunday involves working at the church, it involves a lot of extra prayer to make sure that that work is holy work, joyful work, and that this is still worship. But it still can be work. So no guilt at those who work on Sunday. Neither am I trying to say never play ball on Sunday. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I do want to ask some questions. Because they're relevant for me as somebody who works on Sunday, father of a nine-year-old who's starting to enter sports, and I don't know what's going to happen when some of these games and tournaments start to happen on Sundays. What do we do? So I just want to ask some questions. So just some questions. If, if you work on Sunday, if you have to work on Sunday, the question would be, when do you worship? So for me, I worship while I'm here, but I also need to set aside time it's time for prayer and time for worship where there's no obligation on me, where I'm not worried about saying the right thing or doing the right thing. If you work, when do you worship? Do you worship that evening? Do you worship before you go to work? You know, the early church didn't have Sunday off. The early church met for worship early in the morning before the workday began or late in the evening after it was over. When do you worship? If you play sports, and you travel and you miss church on a Sunday for your sporting commitment, okay, but when do you worship? When do you pray? When do you read the Bible? When are you still? When do you recognize the rhythm of life? And maybe, maybe, is it ever okay to ask when you're about to sign up and you know that this team is going to take you away on Sundays, is it ever okay to ask how many is too many? Just a question. This is a question I'm, I'm wrestling with. Is it, it's just a question. If you travel like we did last week and you miss church, when do you worship? How do you set aside time to keep the Sabbath? Another thing just about work in general would you agree with me that we live in, I mean, they, they used to call New York City the, the city that never sleeps. Would you agree that the whole thing is the city that never sleeps now? We live in a world that's always open. And if you have, if you have a smartphone, the world is always open to you, isn't it? You, for all I know, you could be uh, ordering your groceries right now while you listen. 
to the sermon. The world is always open. It never stops. So the question is, in a world that never stops, in a world that never shuts down, when do you pause? When are you still? When do you have Sabbath? I heard somebody talk about the broken promises of technology. I'm not anti-technology. I'm, I embrace technology. But, but with every new innovation, there's always this promise in there. If, if, you, if you embrace this, it, it will give you more time, more leisure time, more time for your family, more time for the things that... How is that working out? I'd say the results are mixed. Anybody ever hear the old expression? Don't just sit there, what? Do something. Don't just sit there, do something. Anybody feel guilty ever for sitting still? I get antsy. I, I talk to people all the time, and I'm like that a lot. I've got to be doing something. I can't just sit here. You're in a meeting, and you're planning something, and somebody will finally say, well, let's not just sit here. Let's do something. In the last century, a very wise person flipped that on its head, and she said, don't just do something. Sit there. That's what, that's what this is about. We, we, we take time when we could be doing anything else to sit, to sing, to pray, to listen, to share in fellowship. And we need to do that not just on Sunday, but at various points during the day. You need, you need to develop a way of inserting some Sabbath into each and every day where you pause and you give thanks for the goodness of that day. When I meet with couples before they're to get married and we have our, our premarital conversations and we plan the wedding service and we talk about what it means for them to get married, I always ask the question of faith and church. And I say, and I, and I say do, you, do you want you, you and your family that you're going to raise? Do you, want, um, do you want to be a part of church? Oh, yeah. And that they all, of course, they came to the pastor. They know the answer is yes, 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 yes. We want to be in church. I say, okay. I ask him a trick question. It's 10 years from now. What's the day that you're going to decide that you're going to go to church or not? What, what day? And so one of them will say, uh, Monday. We should do it on Monday. And then another one will say, but, you know, the week comes and, and things pop up. Maybe Thursday. No, Thursday. Something might happen on Friday. Let's decide on Friday. I say, eh, eh, wrong. The, decide, the, the day to decide is 10 years ago. You decide 10 years ago that you're setting that time aside. If, if you try to decide week to week, I know because I've done that. When I was off for a year and I was back in school as a student, I'd been a pastor for five years. And three weeks would go by and Kathleen and I would look at each other and say, did we just miss church for three weeks in a row? Oh, my goodness. And if I can do that, anybody can do it. It's just questions. But I will warn you, I will warn you that if we take it lightly, it will have consequences. It will have consequences for our soul. It will have consequences for our spirit. It will have consequences for your family. Our children are watching us. Our grandchildren are watching us. Our neighbors are watching us. How are we handing on the faith if everything else is more important? I said it, it illuminates the rest of the commandments. It does. So if we, if we take Sabbath seriously, what does it do to the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. If we take Sabbath seriously, we get straight on who is God and who is not. If we take Sabbath seriously, we're less likely to commit idolatry because we've been in the fellowship with other believers, worshiping the one true God instead of idols, and so on and so on and so on. We don't covet. That's the 10th commandment. What does covet mean? It means I look at what you have and I go, wow, I really would like one, some of that. I, li I, like what, I like what he's got. I want, I want a car like they've got. I want a, ho a house like they've got. If I'm practicing Sabbath, I learn to be content with what God has given me, and I'm less likely to covet, and I'm less likely to steal, and I might even be less likely to kill you for what you've got too. I love the story of Jesus on the boat with his disciples. Do you remember that story? He was on the boat with his disciples, and this big storm came, and the, the, the boat was about to go under. And they said, Lord, where are you? Do you remember where they found Jesus? He was asleep, like some of you right now. He was asleep right there in the boat. <laughs> and they said, Master, wake up. We're drowning. We're drowning. And Jesus got up, and he looked at the wind and the waves and the clouds, and he said, Peace be still. 
And the Bible says there was a great calm. You might say there was a great Sabbath. It's what Jesus offers. I grew up as a preacher's kid. I had, I had to go to church. I very rarely had a choice. And there were plenty of times when I was in church that I didn't want to be there. Especially when I was a teenager, I did not want to be there. I wanted to be anywhere but there. But you know what? Even when I didn't want to be there, you know what happened? I sang the hymns, or I at least heard the hymns. I said the Apostles' Creed. I said the prayers. I shook hands with people. And you know what's happened over the years? All those times in church when I didn't want to be there, they found me anyway. So there have been times in my life when I, when I thought I had lost my faith and I said, I don't, even know, I don't even know what I believe anymore. I don't even know if I believe. What do I believe? And somewhere in the back of my spirit I heard, you believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. There would be times where I, I was like, I can't pray. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I know I'm supposed to pray. I don't know what to say. And, and, I, and I'll hear a voice say, pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. They find me, and I give thanks. I give thanks. And so I pray that we all will learn to keep the Sabbath holy and know who the one true God is, the God who loves us all and is drawing us close to himself. Amen. Would you join me in a time of prayer? Gracious God, you have granted us the gift of productive work, work that fills us with a sense of purpose, a sense of accomplishment, and that helps us make a difference in our own lives and in the world around us. Yet your spirit also gifts us with a call to holy rest. Help us set aside time, time to rest our spirits, rest our bodies, time to rest from the routine of labor and turn our thoughts to you. Help us appreciate the gift of the rhythm built into your creation rhythm of work and the rhythm of peace by your spirit give us an appreciation for the gift of holy time the time when we can be formed reformed and refreshed you call us to your service in the world call us into a deeper relationship with you, of which Sabbath is a part. We give you thanks for the gift of Sabbath, for the gift of work, for the gift of your church, and for the gift of each other. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our affirmation of faith is found in the, in the bulletin and is also printed on page 882 in the back of your hymnal and let us join in this creed together. Please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died. forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. God has been generous to us, and God invites us to take the opportunity to be generous in return. 
God invites us to share what he has given us with the church to continue its ministry and outreach in the world. And now with the assistance of our ushers, let us return to God, God's tithes and our gifts. thanksgiving in our hearts for all that God has given us let us pray as Jesus teaches his disciples our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Closing hymn is number 529, How Firm a Foundation.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of our living and loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.